Perfect. Well, thank you very much, um, Stephen Sherrill, for that um, much, much too generous introduction. If my late mother were here, being my mother, she would believe every word of it. If my late father were here, being a realist, you would probably wonder who you were talking about. But uh, introductions of that sort remind me of the small boy who fell headfirst into a barrel of molasses. And when they pulled him out, he licked some of the molasses from his face and said, Lord, make my tongue adequate to this occasion. <laughs> well, actually, this is not my night for humor. And I'm not a match for, some of, for either Stephen or George. So I'm not going to be, not even going to try to be funny. Except my first line, and this, that's after this wonderful banquet, I think that I have exceeded the feed limit. <laughs> Bad humor, you better believe it. I wish that I were in a mood for good humor, but I'm not. We are hell-bent in the direction of destroying our planet, and frankly, we appear to be doing very little about it. Decades ago, visitors from other planets warned us about where we were headed and offered to help. But instead, we, or at least some of us, interpreted their visits as a threat and decided to shoot first and ask questions after. The inevitable result was that some of our planes were lost, but how many were due to retaliation and how many were as a result of our own stupidity is a moot point. Wilbert Smith, one of the first Canadians to take an active interest in the subject of UFOs, asked the visitors about the accidental destruction of our aircraft by flying into the vicinity of a flying saucer. The response, and this is uh, Wilbur's words, we were informed that although a few of our aircraft had come to an unfortunate end by what they considered the colossal stupidity of our pilots, they were now taking corrective measures to avoid our aircraft. I asked them, and this is still Smith, I asked them what happened, and they said, well, the fields around the saucers in order to hold them up, in order to produce the gravity differential, the time field differentials which were necessary to operate the ship. These sometimes produced field combinations which reduced the strength of materials to the point where they were no longer strong enough to carry the loads that the materials were expected to carry. Now as we know, aircraft, particularly the military type, are built with a rather small factor of safety. And in these regions of reduced binding, the materials are no longer strong enough to carry the load and the craft simply comes apart. And when I read that, I was reminded of the late great soprano Lily Pons, who used to smash crystal goblets with her high C. She would direct the sound at them, and something in the sound waves would change the structure of the glass, and it would fly apart. Well, this didn't satisfy our military chiefs, who must have thought that it was more important to secure American nuclear superiority, even though using it would result in the annihilation of us all, than to take the hint and start moving the planet back from the brink of global disaster. They, the military, must have been and still are so paranoid that they feel it necessary to use the visitors' technology to fight them off, rather than welcome them as partners in development though they may have seconded a few renegades to 
assist them in what can best be viewed as diabolical, diabolical developments. Stephen uh, has said that talking about UFOs is passé and that we should be talking or limiting our talk to exopolitics. Well, Stephen, I agree with you in theory, but in reality we have a problem when official U.S. policy insists that UFOs don't exist. The veil of secrecy must be lifted and it has to be lifted now before it's too late. It is ironic that the U.S. would begin a devastating war, allegedly in search of weapons of mass destruction, when the most worrisome developments in this field are occurring in your own backyard. It is ironic. It is ironic that the U.S. should be fighting monstrously expensive wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, allegedly to bring democracy to those two countries, when it itself can no longer legitimately claim to be called a democracy when trillions, and I mean thousands of billions of dollars, have been spent on projects about which both the Congress and the Commander-in-Chief have been kept deliberately in the dark. How much has been accomplished in 60 years of feverish activity by some of the most educated minds in the United States? Has America developed flying saucers that are visually indistinguishable from the visitors, as alleged? And if so, what do they propose to do with them? Even more critical, what progress has been made in the development of clean energy sources that could conceivably replace fossil fuels and save the planet from becoming a veritable wasteland. Well, who has the answers? Someone does, but apparently they aren't telling either secretaries of defense or presidents because they don't have, quote, a need to know. In a story told by Dr. Stephen Greer, President uh, Clinton was asked a question by White House reporter Sarah McClendon about why he didn't do something about uh, disclosure. And Clinton replied, Sarah, there's a government inside the government and I don't control it. Excuse me, doesn't the commander in chief and the person who allegedly has their finger on the nuclear trigger have a right to know what his subordinates are doing? The people of the United States who have paid the bills have the right to know. The people of the world demand to know because it is our descendants too whose lives are in mortal danger. It is time for the people of the United States to launch a new war against the evil of lies, deceit, and darkness, and go all out to win the victory of truth and transparency and light. Thank you.